All right, uh, so let's start. Um, yeah, I'm Daniel, <laughs> and I will to do, uh, today talk to you about how you can ensure fairness, especially in domains where you deal with unstructured data. But before uh, I really dive into that, I first want to talk about what unstructured data is and also what I mean with fairness. So when I talk about unstructured data, I talk about, for example, image data, audio data, uh, large text documents, and stuff like that. So basically, data that is not that like uh, well-structured, like tabular data or data, data you would normally find in database, database systems. And why is that an important type of data? It is mainly because, for example, in my case, I work a lot with automo uh, automotive customers. So there you have a lot of, uh, for example, testing and simulation and stuff like that. And these processes are like all centered around physical systems. And when like measuring them, you just generate a lot of this unstructured data. For example, audio recordings of a car uh, you maybe want to uh, do testing for or pictures of some parts you want to analyze for anomalies and stuff like that. So in general, uh, yeah, I mainly deal with those use cases. So what about the term fairness? Uh, I will do keep it pretty like casual, not too academic. And uh, what I mean with that is you basically want to make sure that your machine learning model is working the same way or equally good for different groups uh, that, you, uh, that are relevant for your use case. And I can probably uh, show this in a really uh, brief example. Uh, for example, here we have a use case where you want to basically classify if a patient is susceptible to heart failure based on like some medical uh, parameters. Uh, and uh, yeah, it is pretty obvious that you want this model to work equally well for, for example, younger people, older people, uh, female, male people, and so on. And how do you <laughs> now ensure this? Uh, in this like pretty trivial case, it's tabular data, so you would simply slice your data into for ex uh, different groups. For example, you could measure, okay, for the people where the attribute uh, sex is female, uh, I will get an accuracy of 80%. For the male category, I would get 85 So I could simply compare them like that. But for unstructured data, it is not that easy. And therefore, like I have another example. Uh, in this case, this like a data set is pretty popular for emotion recognition. It's called EffectNet. And there the goal is you basically have uh, portrait pictures of people and you have a label that can be, for example, anger or neutral or happy or something like that. And yeah, could of course be part of a larger system. And also there you want to ensure that the groups in the data are treated fairly. Um, yeah, but <laughs> how do we ensure that now? And yeah, you quickly realize, like before we had this tabular data example, and then we had these attributes like biological sex or, uh, or age group explicitly given. We don't have that here, and that's basically like the case in most like industry use cases I dealt with at least. And uh, yeah, especially if you are like, this is a pretty like obvious example because it's like directly affecting humans, but my talk is also about use cases that are not directly affecting humans. So how could we apply this framework here? Uh, and the key is we have to discover these important subgroups in the data. And this uh, is basically what my talk will be about. So how can we identify groups where we want to measure how well our uh, model works? But before I come to like a practical example, I want to quickly dive into uh, the question. You maybe ask yourself, is this relevant for my use cases if I have like this indirect human impact? And uh, basically, um, my answer to this is yes. Uh, to keep it short, usually you have like use cases with uh, not so structured data, and then you have this human impact axis. 
and there are use cases where you have a high human impact. For example, you could have a medical diagnostics use case like MRI data or something like that. Or um, you could have another use case where the human impact is not so direct. For example, if you want to measure uh, um, like or to like judge the vehicle comfort by the classifying brake noise in vehicles, like a typical use case I usually deal with. Uh, like it's not that important like from ethical standpoint, but still like judging these subgroups in your data, finding them, seeing how well your model performs will just give you really, really good insights where your model fails and also gives you uh, like some actionable insights, like what to improve in your data and your model. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so what is typically the existing workflow I see when I am, um, for example, consulting uh, with customers and so on. Um, usually people not look into their data a lot. Typically they have picked some tar uh, global target metric and that is also important because you somehow have to compare things and have to measure things. Um, but they are really driven by this metric typically, like they usually just measure it in some report and then will iterate on their model and their data with not so much looking into, into the real uh, data and model problems. Maybe there is some, I would say like primitive reporting where you say like the worst five uh, uh, examples or something like that, but that's about it and yeah. Like this, you can like <laughs> not get actionable insights on how to improve your model, and you also cannot ensure that people that are maybe uh, somehow represented in your data set are treated fairly by your model. And I see uh, like several really important components to improve over this. One is uh, being able to interactively analyze your data, so like going beyond the static reports, like just having like the worst five examples or something, that is usually not enough. You should be able to really browse through your data, recognize patterns and stuff like that. So that's one component. We will uh, like uh, soon see what I mean with that uh, in practice. Then also usually what also keeps people from applying these principles is it is just really like time consuming. So it can be helpful to also have mechanisms in place to uh, allow automatic detection of these issues. So that's just like to even make people use it, otherwise it's usually not done. Um, and the other part is maybe like a little less important but still uh, nice, like if you can get effective explanations like you know, okay, these data points work badly and you get an concise explanations to even like more quickly uh, like find an explanation why your model fails, that's also really useful. So <laughs> let's look at our updated model evaluation and to some degree fairness uh, insurance uh, process. Um, usually you first start out, out with the uh, raw data. In case of our emotion recognition case, this is these like raw images. And the first problem we have to deal with is we have to get representations we can even process because you probably know, um, yeah, that's not that easy. Uh, we need some sort of features or vector representations to, um, to, uh, to even make the data searchable for these problems. And what I usually do in this case, or we experienced uh, works well for us, is simply one way is using model embeddings and a really useful resource for this, that is for example the Hugging Face Model Hub. So there's a lot of models that also capture like different properties uh, from the data that can help you like just transform your pictures in these numerical vectors that for example could be like a general image similarity, could be also more specific like for example having like uh, properties of people's faces or something like that. Or you could simply also try to more explicitly extract interpretable features from your data, which is shown uh, below here. There uh, you could, for example, say, okay, the biological sex of the, these pictures shown here is male, 
uh, uh, the race is uh, black and so on. So this will just make the search a little less bothersome later on because you have this interpretable uh, features instead of just numerical vectors. So what do we want to do next? Basically our goal is now to identify the subgroups in the data and therefore we want to find clusters and measure how well these clusters perform according to our target metric. And the first step is finding the clusters in the first place. So this is just finding like groups in the data. So it's like some dimensionality <laughs> reduction plot on embeddings that you see here. Uh, and like you can basically identify, okay, these, this is a group of similar images basically. So they have something in common. Uh, typically what I use for this like clustering, I usually use like a combination of dimensionality reduction approaches and clustering. So for example, just uh, PCA, UMAP, and then some hierarchical clustering approach works pretty well for that. Why hierarchical clustering? This has a simple reason because like you will try to measure the like metric drop on the clusters. And if you look for really small clusters, you will usually get a large metric drop, but the cluster support, so the number of samples are really small, that's usually more related to like errors, like really outliers in the data set. If you look for larger clusters, it will usually be more related to larger unwanted biases. So and this hierarchical clustering gives you both, and you can sort of switch between the uh, different partitionings of the data. And that's uh, yeah, cool about it. Uh, yeah, the next step is pretty trivial. We found those clusters where we have um, yeah, uh, some similarities and now we just measure uh, like how well our model performs on it. We can probably just use our target metric or maybe if there's some imbalances and so on, we have to choose something a li little more uh, sophisticated. But basically it's just like measuring the metric you care about on these clusters. And yeah, then you basically have a list of clusters where you're like uh, generated from your unstructured data where your model is not performing well. You can simply order it and say, okay, I will care for the ones, for example, where the model works worst. Yeah, the, but there's one crucial step missing and this is uh, finding out the, why is the model failing? Because now you have just like, okay, my model fails on certain clusters. But of course you need some interpretation and also need an action you can take to mitigate this. And uh, yeah, basically what proved to be really efficient for, for us is just <laughs> interactively analyzing these results. So you can basically just look at your cluster list yeah, and then just check, okay, what type of images are in this cluster yeah, and then try to visually find uh, similarities between those images and make a good guess why the model is probably failing. Uh, I have to say that this can uh, be substantially easier, easy, more easy if you have these interpretable features because then you can do like a search or a clustering based on these interpretable features and can also here explicitly look at the, these attributes. And this will make the interpretation a little easier in some cases, maybe in some cases, but not like not that, um, cannot capture every problem because you make some assumptions when choosing these interpre interpretable uh, features in the first place. Right, um, yeah, that's basically <laughs> like the typical process that we choose here, like what we also use in customer projects. And uh, now it's demo time, I hope it works. Usually not, but <laughs> um, let's see. So how does this look when we do that interactively? Um, just make sure that this is loaded. Yeah, in this case, you see I have like basically this data set uh, in a uh, data frame. And in this case, uh, like I have the image, so I could use uh, like model embedding for doing this process, or I could uh, 
uh, also use attributes I extracted. So this is like the other way of doing, and that's actually what's implemented here because it's also a little bit faster. Uh, you may ask yourself now, like, how did he get these attributes? In this case, it's a little bit uh, maybe experimental, but I used the Lava model, so like this multimodal LLM that basically takes uh, images and text and just ask it, okay, for this picture, extract, for example, the biological sex of the person, or just tell me, does the person wear glasses, and so on. So yeah, that's what that's a pretty nice trick I did here. You could also use like specific, like more specific models that are just like doing, for example, uh, like age classification or regression or something like that. So uh, that can vary how you do that. But um, yeah, we de and then have our data frame, and then what we did, we captured that like in a this process in a like small open source library you can also look at it's called uh, slice guard and basically uh, it what you do here you <laughs> pass in the data frame you tell it okay i want to find similarity or sim similar clusters uh, cl cluster of similar similar data points on these features and just like in this case these interpretable features um, this is my label, this is the prediction, and this is my metric. And what it will do, it will simply execute this clustering process and the measurement of the metric for you. And later on, you will be able to view an interactive report uh, about this. There are some other things it does. It does some pre-processing, for example. It will recognize that some columns are categorical or nominal and stuff like that. And and does the proper normalization to make the clustering right. Yeah, so now it is running. It will tell <laughs> us something that uh, some features are categorical and so on. And will tell us, for example, the overall metric value here is like 0 0.85 roughly. And um, yeah, now what we can do is just uh, look at an interactive report of this. And I hope that works now. Yeah, it looks like that. I have to just quickly configure the view such that you see something. Um, yeah, basically, I can't really show you. Okay, nice picture. <laughs> it shows that randomly. Uh, yeah, so basically, you can then just like have a cluster list here where you also see like the metric. So you see, okay, like our metric was 0 0.85 for overall data. This works uh, worse. For example, it has like 98 samples and has only 0 0.72. And this is like considered to be a cluster of similar samples according to the attributes we passed in. So if I click on it, I could simply uh, browse through the data and then just try to make a good guess, like what is maybe a similarity. I get some additional hints by the tool, um, uh, which are, it tries to give me like a feature importance for these like categorical features. It says, okay, here's like the glass attribute seems to be p pretty uh, like describing for this cl cluster and also the age group could play a role. So in this case, it's uh, like more senior people with glasses, which seem to work worse. And of course, like if we had the time, we had would have to look more into it. Like if this is really the pattern here, you could, you for example, look at other plots like a confusion matrix, histograms of certain, uh, certain, um, for example, labels, predictions, and so on. Uh, but it gives you a usually a pretty good guess, and you can further look into that. So, uh, yeah, and probably I should also mention that, like, the pre-processing part is a tool called SliceGuard. The, the viewer part is also like a standalone ex data exploration tool you can also look at. It's called Spotlight. Uh, we also put that on, Git, uh, on GitHub. Like, it's also an open source tool. Um, you can check that out. It's basically like was first de developed out of our experiences in customer projects, and now it's like a uh, open source to we offer. Um, yeah, let's go back to the presentation. Um, 
Yeah. So what were the results, for example, in this data set? When we looked at the, attrib uh, when we looked at the like, attribute view, we saw that, for example, you see the, uh, the bars are, uh, are almost equal, like in height, but, for example, the senior group has some drop, like older people, uh, like uh, more senior people, the model worked like roughly 10% or uh, almost 10% worse. There were also uh, some differences uh, uh, related to uh, the race attribute, which was mostly due to uh, mislabeled data. So like, for example, there was a lot of non-angry people on pictures. They were labeled angry, which is bad. And, um, but also a lot of uh, findings where like it was more like, um, for example, people wearing glasses, wearing hats, like everything that covers up your face, maybe in addition to some uh, uh, race, uh, racial uh, features. So, and this like, of course, a like example to make it like pretty like obvious how this works, but uh, usually I don't apply it on these like human centric data sets, right? Uh, was also a little bit more mentioned in my abstract, but like the example was a little bit far from that. Usually I apply it on, for example, also data sets with audio recordings of cars or like, for example, a predictive maintenance case. You may want to check, okay, is it working equal, equally well for all my machine instances I have or for all my machine types I have or something like that. This is also like similar and also there these principles just hold true and you can pretty much switch out just like the embedding model. Uh, all right. Uh, uh, the embedding model and probably need a tool like Spotlight where you can, for example, look at image data and audio data uh, like equally uh, or also at the same time. It's like a multimodal thing. Uh, yeah, you maybe now ask yourself like how can we mitigate these biases? Um, and there I have to tell you, usually it's re really highly use case specific and problem specific. Typically, there will be like more technical <laughs> measures, like you can simply change the balance of your data, you can probably switch out some labels. Uh, but there's also other stuff like, for example, if some group of data uh, is uh, underrepresented, you maybe have to acquire more data or you really have to change your uh, labeling process to rule out these labeling issues you maybe also saw in this data set, right? So uh, that could also be uh, uh, something you want to look at. Uh, yeah, getting started, I have to keep it brief. Um, you saw the tools, have a look, maybe it's useful for you. <laughs> it's those like SliceGuard uh, automatic detection, a spotlight for interactive exploration. Yeah, my conclusion uh, is maybe like, okay, I rarely see people doing this on unstructured data. If you use the right tools or take advantage of the open source tooling available, for example, also from Hugging Face and so on, it's pretty easy or not easy, <laughs> you said too much, but it's, uh, it's doable. Uh, I feel like in a lot of use cases it would be better if people care for this, so uh, think twice if it's necessary to do this in your use case and otherwise profit from the performance gains, it's also not bad. And yeah, of course now I made a reference to Gen AI and LMs. <laughs> Um, yeah, uh, in this use case, it's also important because we see a lot, for example, our tools getting a lot of more traction because those models rely on unstructured data for training and output unstructured data. So I feel like that's also something that will increase uh, in importance somehow. All right, so that's it. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Daniel, for this great talk. Um, and thanks for sending in the questions. Um, the first one is, many studies show the dangers of inferring characteristics like gender, race, and emotion from images. Is it okay to tackle fairness with problematic labeling? Yeah, that's a good question. And I feel like there is not so clean answer. I should, you should just be sensitive to uh, like that models can output bad things. Also, for example, the approach I took, like I did like this pre-labeling or automatic labeling of uh, certain attributes. And yeah, of course, uh, that's why, for example, I think there has to be like 
other approaches as well, like for example, interactively looking at the data, like not just blindly trusting stuff. So that's what it's basically all about in the first mm -hmm. place. And that also is true when setting up these like automati uh, automatic processes, like you have to think twice, uh, like where there's something really critical and if you can do it automatically or need like maybe manual review. Best actually to use a combination of right. various methods, right? right. Yeah. Um, and then another question, um, how do you make sure initial representations are not biased? For example, by stereotypes, wouldn't this distort the entire evaluation setup? Yeah, for sure. Uh, and I think that's like a pretty similar answer to the one before. Uh, it's only like, of course, like you can have no perfect evaluation setup. There's tools that can help it. I see like a lot of people don't even apply it because it's too much like work. So uh, you can at least try to make it easier for people getting into this, uh, right? Uh, but of course, yeah, if you have the resources to do like a complete manual evaluation, you can also take this approach. Thank you. And then um, how to interpret problem clusters in case of huge data where it's not practically easy to visually detect them? Yeah. I think that's pretty much related also to the uh, difference between interpretable features I mentioned and like the embedding based approach. Mm -hmm. the, like the, the good thing about this interpretable features is that they can help getting pretty concise uh, explanations. For example, if I have a large text document or a, a cluster of large text documents, it's really hard to find the pattern just by quickly looking at, looking at it. And then you can rely on, for example, supporting techniques like topic modeling, where you, for example, get the list of the most prominent topics in those documents to get like a better grasp of this uh, like large data um, quickly. So that's also something like a bachelor student of mine recently implemented. So, mm -hmm. yeah. next one: How does Lama multimodal classify someone's biological sex? How reliable do you think this prediction is purely based on an image? That's a good question, and I can probably not answer that because okay. I didn't evaluate it. Yeah. <laughs> and then the last one here, um, is this fairness strategy only applicable to categorical data? No, uh, it's, it's not, and that's what like, I think sh should be like I said. There is like the, this interpretable feature way, but usually a lot of times you use the embedding-based way, you will just like create model embeddings from some like uh, image classification model or something, or an audio, audio classification model could also be like a text embedding uh, model, like sentence transformers is a good library for that, for example. And then you can still apply this clustering approach. Yeah, you find the problem clusters, you still will have more, as we uh, heard in the previous question, have more trouble like getting the final interpretation of the like why the model fails. But mm -hmm. it is applicable to unstructured data pretty, pretty well, yeah. Any more questions here in the audience? Anything that we haven't covered here? If not, always feel free to sure. reach out yeah. to Daniel, ask him directly. And thanks a lot, everyone, for being here. And thanks, Daniel. Thank